جی السلام علیکم السلام شیخ I just wanted to ask uh, a few questions in uh, I'll like maybe a question in English if if that's okay with you. Okay, that's fine. Um okay, so basically like I I am coming from a Sunni background. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh it was was with the Deobandis for a long time and I had a kind of like you know figured out that they're messed up in a lot of things. So so I'm in really in a discovery phase and uh, trying to figure out every like you know uh lost trust in a lot of things right so obviously like uh i i just found your uh lectures and youtube video very recently a few days ago so my question to you is that okay so i uh, like i uh i, I want to like explore everything before i make a decision on what's uh what i'm going to gravitate towards so far the she uh view seems very like i mean i i, I think there's a lot of problem in the sunni narration uh so the thing is like uh here here's a question like I, I, my question is with the hadith uh like the the hadith uh um, you know sciences and she she uh, well can you tell me a little bit about the uh like you know how uh, the hadith preservation the you know so there are um, two ways yeah. that hadith were preserved in islam one is by the umar way one is shia way Our brethren in Islam, they concurred. The Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. And Quran had not been um, compiled. And Hadith was never compiled during his lifetime. And Sahaba, did, did, uh, there were some Sahaba who wrote some Hadith, but those scriptures were lost. They were never narrated from. And then it was Sahaba and Sahaba's memory. And we depend on their honesty that they truthfully and uh, holy narrated the sayings and the actions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, these things are questionable. There is no reason that Sahaba could not lie. And there's no reason Sahaba could not forget. And there's no s- reason to believe that Sahaba would not be prejudiced by their own political inclinations and their own political uh, interests. Uh, furthermore, uh, during the uh, lifetimes of Sahaba, there was no effort by Sahaba to preserve Hadith. There were no schools, there were no lectures, there were no... There, were, there was no platform, no framework in which Sahaba made sure that all the things they learned from the Nabi Wasallam were transferred to the coming generation. There is no evidence of that. All the narrations of a Hadith that you have, see from the companions, there are conversations that something comes up and they mention something or there was a need for something and they mention something they are not in the framework of a school of a lecture of 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 an institute whereby the objective is to make sure that these this information the sayings of the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam are preserved after that it's the generation of the tabi'in and after them the tabi'i tabi'in And also them, they, they, were, they did not write hadith. It was all based on memory. And uh, it was also, it was, uh, obviously with respect to Sahaba, our brethren say that they do not lie and they do not forget. <laughs> and, uh, but because they never do jarh of Sahaba. With respect to Tabi'in, they agree that they could lie and they could be untrustworthy and they could forget. So after Tabi'i, 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 it was after year 150, around one year, year 150, that 120-ish, that, that they started writing. Chronicling of Hadith began by writing. And at that time, people did not, were really not trained in writing well. That is the problem. So people, because there were no schools, Arabs did not know how to write. There was few people who knew, who knew how to write, but they made a lot of mistakes and uh, putting the dots and whatnot. That made a big difference in writing. So even if a person wrote hadith, it doesn't mean what he wrote was something that was um, really preserved what he was. Uh, and they, these writings were mostly for, for the person himself. They were not books for other people to read. These were notes that people wrote because they heard hadith and they chronicled the hadith in writing for later use. So the time of Tadween of Hadith compilation of Hadith comes after two centuries in the third century. Ahmad ibn Hanbal passes away in year 225. 
Bukhari dies at the year 255. Muslim dies at the year 260. So that is when hadith were written. So there's a long period between the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the chronicling of books of hadith, the writing of books of hadith. A big portion of this duration is the period in which hadith was never written. It was solely dependent in, uh, on, the, on the memory of people. And memory is very faulty. And it's just not memory. People are biased. People, of course, if they like something, they will, they will sh shed it in a very good light. And if they dislike somebody, they will, dis they will uh, abstain from narrating good things about him. And they will find something negative to narrate about him. And it was obviously Muslim history is full of animosity and infighting and many things. So that's one way that hadith was narrated. And if you take something that was preserved through this mechanism, obviously you cannot take it to any academia and rely upon it that it will pr prove anything historical or anything scientific or take it to any legal court. And on the basis of a narration as such, a judge would rule, uh, could rule definitely that this really happened so because there's big, there, because of the question of the impossibility of, um, of make, being sure that it's indeed true. Now, that is the, uh, how our brethren narrated hadith. According to Madhab of Ahl al Bayt, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew. That he's living amongst a people who are unlearned, who do not know how to write, read and write. Illiterate people. So, and he had brought all this information from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This message that encompasses every aspect of human life. Not only that society, which was a very backward society which was not very advanced at the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam brought a oh. message from Allah that has guidance for the most advanced civilizations to come thousands of years ahead of us. And all questions that mankind would have with regard to creation, with regard to the Yawm Al Qiyamah, with regard to the uh, attributes of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and with regard to our actions, how to live a proper life. So it was impossible for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to preserve that information by relying on Sahaba who are illiterate people whose, whose brain, whose minds, whose imagination does not go beyond what is in that backward society of Medina of, of that time. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam transferred all of his knowledge to Ahl al-Bayt Alaihi Wasallam to Amir al-Mu'mineen Alaihi Wasallam. He dictated Everything that Allah had given him from knowledge. From his holy mouth, with his own words, to Amir al Mu'minin, I mean, he wrote everything down. And aside from that, he said everything and he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make sure that Amir al Mu'minin does not forget anything. And Allah accepted his prayers. And Ahl al Bayt alayhi was, and he made, he told his ummah that after him, after me, when I die, the only way that you could uh, find salvation and hap and find eternal bliss and happiness is by following Quran in Ahl al Bayt alayhi salam. And that his brother is the Mawla of every person he is a Mawla of. Salamullah alayhi wa Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam from his time. His companions used to write down his ahadith. Kitab Sulaim ibn Qais is written by his companion of Amir al Mu'minin Ali alayhi the uh, We do not have a ilm of jarh and ta'adil because we don't rely on chains of narration. We have ilm of al musannifin, Kitab al Faharis, the books of indexes, uh, of bibliographies of, uh, of people who have written books. So the Ashab of Aima alayhi salatu wassalam, they were all, all of our narrators, they were authors. They wrote a hadith. They wrote a hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ahl al-Bayt alayhi wassalam. And Ahl al-Bayt alayhi wassalam had majalis, they had sessions whereby they would dictate and people would write down their sayings. 
And these were the, the the result was this of this was thousands of books, thousands of epistles of hadith at the time of Imam Ja'far al Sadiq alayhi salam, Imam al Kadim alayhi salam. And the students of these Imams alayhi salam, they also wrote, uh, the students of the students of Imams alayhi salam, they wrote books. So if you go to our books of hadith, books of Faharis, you see thousands of books. So time comes to the time of Kulaini and Shaykh al Saduq. And the like. So they had in front of them this rich libraries of uh, trustworthy and truthfully narrated hadith that they could be sure 100% that these are the words of Imams alayhi salam. From those, they wrote the books that we have today Kitab al Kafi, Kitab al Malai Hadar al Faqih, and the like. So Shia books have been narrated, not orally. They rate it through manu manuscripts. That is the big difference between us and the, the Mukhalifi. Yeah. You have another question? Yeah, thank you very much. Just to follow up. Sure. So uh, the manuscripts, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of manuscript research in Western academia and also, I mean, throughout the Muslim world. I'm just wondering, this this uh, um, uh, this rich turath of the Shia scholarship, uh, where uh, do we have like extant manuscripts or is there an opportunity to engage in research uh, in, in this so, sort of study? And what are the centers that one should be uh, looking to go into to, to have an access to, to so this? So manuscripts, it's very difficult to preserve the original manuscripts that were written by the okay. authors because they were written on papers and paper. After a few years, paper deteriorate. Usually paper deteriorates within a one person's lifetime. We are talking about that over a thousand years. In the Muslim world, there was no mechanism to preserve manuscripts. However, these manuscripts are preserved through copying, through copying. So there right. are many books. Right. Yeah. So, so you, you can so go to any, you, yeah, on, online libraries, they carry many books that were written at the time of the Imams. Alayhi so personally, <laughs> you yourself, you don't, even have, like, you don't you? even have to go to a physical library. You can go online, do search. You'll see lots of books that were written on, during the lifetime of the Imams. Alayhi Just two follow up questions short. Uh, yeah. Could you give us like, uh, you know, g g give me a site or a bunch of sites where uh, I can find the Shi Qutubs because I'm, I'm not used to like, I you can no go to alfikr, alfikr.org. They have very good books. Al alfikr.org. Al uh, okay. That's, yeah. that's one question. And the second question is like, as far as your own training, uh, so, so are, are, have you trained from like a, uh, like you know, um, my understanding is that you're you're a trained scholar. So wh where did you study, and where would you so, recommend? So so I study? studied in Qom and in Najaf al Ashraf, but they don't teach oh, these yes. things things that I tell you. They don't. Okay. It was a waste of time okay. for me. I mean, I learned some things, some things, but I also wasted a lot of my time. And I tell all people who want to go to Qom and Najaf, that's a big waste of time. So the things that I teach people, these are my research, my my effort that I compile up through years of hard work. Yeah, but the, I went there in Qum and Najaf. They teach you some basic things, but there are the basic things that they teach and a lot of, a lot of useless things they teach. The basic I mean, things that they teach are not better than what they teach in Arab uh, countries. And the useless thing they, things they teach, they're very, very good at it, but they're useless. So they teach a lot of usul al-fiqh, a lot of mantiq, a lot of philosophy, a lot of kalam especially philosophy, a lot of uh, uh, tasawwuf, they teach. <laughs> you, could, you could spend five lifetimes there and keep learning, but, but they, they have nothing to do with Islam. Right. And, and do you, maybe I said two questions, but I, sorry, I'm really in a situation I'm trying, trying to figure out. Is there, is there a concept of like sohba? Uh, in in your understanding from the little bit like you know are, so you means being compa them? companion to to have been around a person of course who can deny in 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 in, in the more like you know in the tasawwuf yeah but we do not believe like, you know, any person who saw the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he professed his prophethood and he professed the words of uh shahadatain that he is he indeed he is truthful and he is going to be good for the rest of his life yeah, what he did was good. A person who goes to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and embraces Islam, that itself is good if he's not a hypocrite, if he's not a munafiq. 
But there's no guarantee that later on he may not do some bad things or he may not lie or he may not cheat. There are Sahaba who have been, um, who were, who were uh, stoned to death by the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for adultery. There were Sahaba who were, uh, who Omar and Uthman, they lashed them for drinking wine. There were Sahaba who, be, who uh, Talha ibn, uh, uh, Tulayha ibn Khuwaylid al-Asadi, he was a Sahabi. He claimed prophethood when Prophet was Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was alive. So yes, of course, we Sahaba, meaning that someone goes to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and sees him. That is all. obviously that's true. Who can deny that? But it does not, that does not guarantee that this person will have an upright character for the rest of his life. So Sahabi are just like uh, other people. They, they are subject to examination, whether they, they have failed or whether they have had good, good character. I guess my question was more uh, in the line of like, when, when you're studying, when you're trying to get close to Allah and trying to understand the understanding of Alul Bayt, uh, do you suffice yourself only with the uh, kutubs that are existent? Or do you also refer to a living chain of scholarship in your partic particularly yourself? Like, uh, oh no, that living chain of narration does, doesn't have doesn't have any doesn't have any practical value at all. I have I have a jaws of narration, but what does it mean? It just means nothing. Um, chain of narration now between myself and Kulaini, it, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything much. It's just it's just a formality. All right. So in summary, uh, I guess study, learn and try to practice and then you'll gain the spirituality and um, closes to Allah. Is, is that what you're uh, pretty much? So chain, of narration, chain of narration is something else. Spirituality. Your spirituality is that if you if you have sincerity and you pray. Then you find your spirituality if you don't commit sins. OK, that's certain. That's 100 percent. There's no. That is guaranteed with certitude. That's having a good question. character, not, not lying, yeah. not cheating, not committing sins, and praying sincerely. Yeah. Okay, no more questions? Just a Thank you. Uh, Allah thank bless you. you. Thank you. Okay, bro.